My name is Halima Tuhima. I am from Niger, currently a PhD candidate in development economics. And my research primarily focuses on education, where I try to understand the linkages between inequalities and learning outcomes. Basically, how does the environment in which a, a child or a student grows and develops affect what they learn, how they learn, uh, but also, most importantly, how they project themselves into the future. Uh, but beyond the individual level analysis, one, one, also, one thing that I also really try to understand is how can African countries shift their educational systems towards um, systems that work for the Africa that we have today and Africa that we want in the next few years, really uh, thinking about the education as a space that helps us build our communities, but also our economies and our countries. I think the work that I'm doing is and would be extremely important as African countries try to revamp their educational systems. There have been a lot of studies uh, recently that have shown that although access to education has greatly improved or access to schooling has improved in a lot of countries, we do not see quality. So you have a lot of children going to schools and not learning much. Or oftentimes they're learning sk um, skills that may not necessarily be easily transferable into everyday um, benefits. So uh, the impact would be quite important if we are able as a global or as a community of scientists and practitioners to come up with ways to help countries move from that state of inadequacy to a place where they can actually use the educational system as a driving force, I think it could be really transformative for many. And beyond the countries, I think even at the individual level, you know, that, that the expectation from families, from communities, is that when you send your child to school, uh, the basics would be met. The basics being being, um, being able to learn, being, being able to read, being able to write, and beyond that, really develop some sort of critical thinking. And unfortunately, a lot of the um, especially public educational systems aren't offering that today in African countries. And we need to change that if, if we are to move forward. I think it drives at the heart of what it means to have quality educational systems. Today, I do not understand how for instance, uh, a, a history program in a country like Niger or even Nigeria would not have uh, figures like Nana Asma'u who have really defined the educational space in the 18th century in African countries or West African countries in ways that are really transformative. I think a lot of times African um, students or even younger Africans have a, have a difficulty projecting themselves into the future because they don't see people like them who have done things um, that have transformed a particular sector or that have transformed a particular way of thinking. And it's not because they don't exist, they are there. It's just that we haven't really found a way to systematically profile um, the African voices who have helped to shape not just Africa, but uh, the, the world. I think that needs to change. If we're thinking about decolonizing um, uh, the, the, the curriculum, I think that's, or decolonizing education, to me that is where it begins. It has to begin at the base. It has to, and then it has to be systematically embedded up to the highest level. I think there have been a lot of um, movements in primarily in, in, in that, that have started primarily in South Africa that have been um, that have spread to other parts of the world, including uh, Brazil, the UK. I think it's a very worthy cause, and and it's something that uh, that that I that I think universities have to take up very, very seriously. If we take a lot of, if we look at a lot of um, francophone, for example, if we, we, the term francophone is not a term that I uh, fully endorse, but if you look at countries where French is the language of instruction in universities, a lot of these movements um, 
I think are struggling to take roots and that is because when we look at institutionally how these places have been built up, there are a lot of challenges that haven't yet been properly met. So I think, yes, the, the issue of decolonization, decolonizing, decolonization of education is key, it's important, it's critical. Um, and, and, and even when we talk about um, you know, this increasingly digitizing world, we need to think about what it means to, to be in that, in that, in that space. most critical, I think, uh, at, at the level of countries is to start to seriously invest in higher education. Um, if you take historically countries like Japan or even China, I think one of the main reasons why they have been able to leapfrog into from being um, you know, poor developing countries to the countries that they are today is because they have really um, managed to strategically invest in many fields, including science and research. Because at the end of the day, um, research has to be contextual. And, and I think African researchers, African scientists are, are very well positioned to do research that has the capacity and the potential to change our countries. And I think a second gap is the fact that some of this research is actually happening in, in a lot of our universities and institutions of higher learning. But there's a very massive and wide gap between uh, research, policy, and practice. So a lot of that research doesn't get translated into practice and vice versa. A lot of the practice that we have oftentimes is not informed by um, proper critical research. I think it's really important and critical that we bridge that gap between those two worlds, you know, bridging that gap between the research, the policy and the practice in order for um, our research to not to be to be relevant and in also for the practice to be drawing on a, like the massive pool of, of, of research findings that I think can really inform how we are how we go about seeing certain sectors and certain fields and and development itself. Oftentimes I say that three of the pillars of any economy, one is the government, two, um, the, the, the private sector, and three, yes, the research community. And these three have to work together. Government in the sense that government have the possibility and the capacity to create an enabling an enabling environment for good research to happen. And I think as, 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 as someone who calls herself a Pan-African, a Pan-Africanist, we need to think beyond the, the confines of our own frontiers. I think in terms of trade, African countries are moving towards that, we know, with the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. I think that it's critically important that that also includes the movement of minds, the movement of ideas, and the movement of, of research and work. So really creating um, a Pan-African platform where African researchers can build on the research that each might be doing in their respective countries or their respective labs. And I think this is something that governments can facilitate and must facilitate to, for, for, for that research to flourish. Uh, in terms of the, the private sector, I mean, the private sector um, has a lot of financial resources that I think can be used to, 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 to match good research to questions that may have. There's actually a particular case in my country, in Niger, where a local company had questions that, you know, they were, they were asking themselves about their operations and a particular product that they were developing. And at the same time, at the university, there was a researcher, a young researcher who was doing work on that very specific question. So that is really a perfect match. You know, um, th that company was able to fund the student who was looking for funding. So I think what I see um, uh, the private sector um, interacting with the, with the research community would be something at that level, but done in a more systematic way. This case that I just talked about was a happy accident. So what I want to see happen is really 
systematizing the happenings of those happy accidents, such as the, the private sector really plays its role in the research, in the research community. And I think that is already happening um, in a lot of countries. Some African countries also are beginning to take the lead on that. But I, I think it needs to happen for, for, for research to, 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 to be fully, fully to, to be deployed to its uh, fullest capacity in, uh, in a lot of our African countries. I'm at a very critical juncture of my career. I'm just about to complete my PhD um, and I'm, I'm really happy with, with the work that I've managed to do with the kind of data that I was able to get. So for me, one thing that would be extremely important in the next five years would be able to, to use um, my voice, to use my skills to develop excellent research in various research institutions, uh, but most importantly, to be able to be um, that person who's positioned to make the link between policy and practice. Because I've had a chance um, before starting my PhD to work in various communities, um, primarily in Niger, and and I think there is a there there, there is a gap, and and and, and um, as someone who's who's managed to work in these both in both these worlds, I want to be able to contribute in a way um, that furthers good research that changes lives, but also in a way that um, to to be on a platform where I could use some of that research to inform. Uh, practice. Um, I think 10 years is, is a bit um, far off for me, but what I envision is a space where, um, where I think I could, I could use my voice um, along with other people who are working in similar fields to push for change at a systematic level in our countries. I will have to aspiring ambassadors, NEF ambassadors, would be to just try. It is. It has been just a year, but it has really been one of the most transformative experiences I've had um, in recent time uh, for many reasons. One, I've had opportunity to meet amazing African scientists. And to be honest, being a researcher as an African, uh, especially in a Western institution, can be quite isolating. Um, uh, and, and I think to be in a space where you see Africans really pushing the frontiers of, of research has been one of the biggest gifts that NEF has given me. And I'm so incredibly grateful you know, to be able to engage with fellow ambassadors, but also the NEF fellows who are just fantastic human beings who are really doing good work. And to me, they are an inspiration to, to push my, my work, to push research in a way that really contributes to humanity. And I, I think the other thing that I will say is that many of us um, young researchers or scientists or whatever, young people really try to find a way uh, to contribute to our countries or our various communities. And, and for me, one of the best ways I've done it uh, in, the, in the last couple of years was through the Africa Science Week, which brought together thousands of people. And I was so pleasantly surprised to see how much need and how much demand there is for something like this in my country. And I've had a chance to attend other Africa Science Week um, in other countries and it has been a similar response. So really it's, it's a beautiful community of Pan-African researchers and scientists that is coming together and I'm so happy and so honored to be part of it, to grow with it, but also to be able to contribute to it in a very uh, meaningful way. So if you're thinking about being an F ambassador, I say do not hesitate. Uh, they are NEF ambassadors in almost every African country, approach them, ask them questions and just learn.